So, uh, good morning and thank you, Rod, very much for inviting me. It's uh, fantastic to be here and present. Um, I'll start off by explaining about this uh, red cardigan that Rod asked me to wear. Uh, <laughs> that's because this cardigan was knitted for me by my mother about 35 years ago and for, um, I wore it for about 5 or 10 years and then I couldn't fit into it for about another 20 years. Um, because I, you know, what happened to me happens to, to most people. I put on the, the average half a kilogram a year that, uh, that we do when we get to our 30s and 40s and uh, by the time I got to 60 I was uh, uh, 69 kilos and uh, couldn't, couldn't fit in and then discovered uh, low carb through various mechanisms and uh, went low carb, lost uh, eight, nine kilograms and could fit into this again. So thank you, thank you, Rod. <laughs> this is a shot of me with uh, with David Unwin. So I met David Unwin in October 2019 when he presented at the uh, Low Carb Conference in the Gold Coast and uh, he presented a talk which I'd like to say is, uh, my, mine's based on uh, and uh, I went up and spoke to him afterwards. David's the one on the right. You know. um, <laughs> uh, uh, and I went up and talked to him and uh, he, he just inspired me to, to try doing this and so I've, I've done this. Also I'd like to thank Ron Raab and Liz Fraser, who have been inspirations in this work. Uh, so I do have, I don't think it's a conflict of interest, I've got a vested interest. When uh, my daughter-in-law was featured in this article in the, uh, in, uh, around uh, Australia with the launch of Defeat Diabetes, uh, she's had uh, type 2 diabetes for a few years, um, and uh, she's gone low carb, and uh, as it says, uh, she's been able to decrease her HbA1c from uh, the 8s down to 5.9 and lost... Uh, lost 12 kilograms. It's an ongoing journey, it's a difficult sort of thing and uh, when you develop diabetes as a young person, type 2 diabetes as a young person, it's, it's quite difficult to turn around but she's certainly going on that track. So that's my vested interest in this. I'm a GP at the East Bentley Medical Group and I'll just thought I'll give you a little bit of details about that group. Uh, we're roughly a 15 doctor practice. Uh, we have uh, one trainee GP registrar, we have six nurses, about 12 medical receptionists, and we take medical students. So that's the demographics of our... I don't think I've left anybody out. So I, I recruited patients the following way. I looked at patients who had been seeing me uh, just as my regular patients who had type 2 diabetes, and I, uh, I sort of tried to convince them to go low carb, and I, I reckon about two-thirds of those agreed. And then I would also get some patients from other GPs in the practice who I would see just because they would... Uh, see me intermittently and I would say to them are you interested in trying to see if we can improve your diabetes and I would say maybe a third of them uh, would agree and this is a little blurb that I would say to them oops is right uh, the low carb the low fat high carb diet we tried for the last 20 years uh, has caused your diabetes blood pressure and heart disease oops except uh, for me it was about uh, 40 years so I explain a little bit about low carb to them uh, and ask if they're interested in trying something quite different to see if we can improve their uh, glucose control. I explain, I'm quite out, out there, and I explain that it's not accepted by the majority of health professionals, that uh, we're in a minority, 5 to 10%, I would guess, but uh, I've certainly found it to work better than anything else, and I get an idea of their interest. And then I explain the basic uh, physiology of glucose metabolism, which probably most of you all are very familiar with. Complex carbs, I mean, we all were taught that complex carbs are the good carbs and that, you know, because they get broken down a lot slower, but they get broken down to glucose and it says this on the diabetes website, this is not a secret. The diabetes website also says that this has the biggest impact on your sugar levels, that's not a secret. And then they tell you to go and eat carbs. Hmm. And I say, I don't understand this. Uh, and then I use some of the infographics by David Unwin, which are just fantastic and, you know, I show them this slide and other sorts, other sorts of uh, slides that he's done and explain that one bowl of basmati rice is 10 spoons of, sh of sugar that sort of gets broken down to and that's roughly the same as a can of coke and they all sort of, everybody is aghast and go through the other lists and then you go down the bottom and you have something like eggs and you have two or three eggs and that's about zero spoons of sugar. How amazing is that? And I use uh, Peter's uh, wonderful colour chart, thank you Peter, wherever you are in the audience, uh, and I give those out and uh, give big ticks on the, side, on the left side and a question mark in the middle and big crosses on the right hand side and hopefully they follow that. And then I use the article that I co-authored with, well Liz co-authored yeah, uh, together, Liz Fraser, thank you, and uh, authored an article in Australian Doctor and uh, they were very generous in, 
being us, uh, uh, giving us this space, this two-page article. And then I give them some resources. So most of the times I would get an email address and I would send them some links, lots of links. I mean, there's a bucket load of links out there and I, these are just some of the options. And I now, you know, in the last few months, have been also referring them to the Defeat Diabetes uh, app and getting them to do that. And then I put it into practice by asking them, you know, what they've eaten in the last 24 hours. I recommend low-carb changes. A lot of them have had muesli and cereal because we're all, you know, been told how great they are. And, you know, and I say, well, maybe try some eggs and eggs and bacon or smoked salmon or whatever you, you like. I just medications according to the... I won't go through that, but make sure that it's all done safely. Um, tell them it's now time to have a little bit of salt if you're going low carb and I generally review them in one to two weeks, uh, check what they're eating, how they're going, see if they've lost some weight, check their satiety, their hunger and just see how they go and then, then usually at that time I'd get them to try and skip breakfast and maybe uh, introduce a 24-hour fast and tell them how to do that safely. A lot of them ask me what I eat and I'm quite happy to share it and I've got some photos on my, f uh, on my phone and so I'll sh show them what I'm eating because it's good to get visual. So I say nothing for breakfast, you know, make sure you keep fluids, you've got to, got to keep the kidneys working. Uh, and then for lunch, that's when I have a decent amount to eat and two or three egg omelette there with some leftover cauliflower from the night before and some leftover chicken. So whatever you sort of have, there's nothing magical about this, just standard sort of stuff. And dinner, you know, protein sort of based dinner, so I might have some chicken livers or some uh, uh, salmon, fantastic, you know, just delicious, and um, you know, some lamb, some uh, steak, all good stuff, all real food. And then for snacks, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm still a bit of a chocoholic, so I still like my dark chocolate, and uh, then some other things, nuts and cheese, and uh, yeah. So this is an example of, uh, you know, some of the successes that we get. This is a gentleman who saw me, you can see that he's HbA1c, uh, he sort of became pre-diabetic in 2001, so 20 years ago, then seemed to get lost to the system. Uh, you know, his HbA1c went up to, what is it, um, 8.1, I think it is. Oh, 10.3, oh wow, even worse than I thought, 12.7. And that's when I saw him, and uh, we made an intervention at July 2019, uh, started him on metformin, which I think is a really good drug for diabetes, and the low carb. And then three months later, he's uh, HbA1c's, uh, oh, sorry, it's 6.1. Yeah, that's it's a bit faint. Um, and that was uh, October 2019, and that's been maintained for uh, 15 months. So we'd say he's in remission, 5.6, 5.8, 6.0 5, uh, 6 and 5.7. He was pretty happy with that. It's actually been maintained 15 months now. Uh, and this is the example of my uh, daughter-in-law, who you met earlier. Um, she was on metformin and dapagliflozin. We had to stop that because of the uh, you know, ketoacidosis dangers. Um, that's been her uh, HbA1c. Sorry, it's a bit faint. 7.7, .7, then it went up to 8.3, and that's around the time she started low carb. Then it went down to 6.9 and 6.3. And her journey's been a little bit trickier. You can sort of see um, in May of last year, it went up to 7.5. Anybody guess why that happened? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and now she's starting to settle down again and the, the one in February which has gone up again is Christmas and New Year and, and this is what happens, people sort of struggle, it'd be nice if they all, everyone just embraced it but that's not the reality. Okay, on to the audit. So I looked at, I've done a couple of audits, well, I've done a few but I'll, I'll share two. So one is an audit of people who I looked at between May and December of last year and I compared them uh, to, to, to their readings 12 months earlier. So the aim was to see if what I'm doing is actually doing some good or whether I've just got these anecdotes which, which work. Uh, so I was comparing uh, my low-carb eating to people in the control group. So the inclusion criteria were people who I saw with NIDM um, between May and December and they'd had to have at least two HbA1c's performed approximately 12 months uh, apart. Uh, 65 patients met the criteria. Uh, 32 were in the intervention group, meaning low-carb eating, and 33 were in the control group. So that was nice and even, which was good. Uh, Ten of the people in the control group were my patients who I couldn't convince to try low-carb. They just thought it was too hard. Uh, and 23 were, were people with diabetes from other GPs who were a lot less likely to take on my recommendation because, you know, I'm not their regular GP. So I only got a few of those to, to try low-carb. 
so these are the results, uh, and you can sort of see the groups are fairly similar. The uh, control group was slightly older. Uh, the time that I followed was similar. Their HBO and Cs were much the same. At uh, 12 months, the uh, control group had gone up 0.4, which is what it says on the diabetes website. The diabetes is a chronic uh, condition that gets worse. It says it on the website, and you know, in 10 years, you'll like, you, you, know, you, you may well need insulin. That's just the progression of the disease. They don't, you know, that, that's, that's, they're quite upfront about that. And this is what you know, we see here, a, a gradual increase in the HbO and C and needing 1.8 medications. Uh, I'm pleased to say the intervention group, the low-carb group, uh, you know, improved. You can see that there's a, they went down by 0.8. Uh, and they're on less medications because we had to stop certain medications, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the um, sulfonylureas usually. Uh, so they're on less medication. Um, and I think this 1.2 difference is a clinically important difference. Also looked at the number of people in this group who, became, who had a non-diabetic HbA1c, meaning a HbA1c less than 6.5. And it started again, very similar numbers. Uh, 12 months later, uh, it had gone from seven to five in the control group, which I guess is in keeping with what Diabetes Australia tells us, whereas the intervention group had gone from seven to 11, so uh, that had gone up 34%, uh, which is not as good as what uh, David Unwin and, and the Vertitrol gets, but it's still better than the uh, control group. And again, I would say that this increase in non-diabetic HbA1Cs uh, is a clinically important difference. Now, I, I shared these results with a colleague of mine, an endocrinologist, and uh, most uh, endocrinologists uh, aren't enthusiastic about low carb, we can say, and that was certainly the response I got. Oh, yeah, you can do things that might work for six months or 12 months, but you know what? You know, most people uh, it doesn't work down the track. So you know, people just. So you know, I thought, well, that's a, a valid point. Let's let's see if what is happening. So I, I then went back to when I started low carb, which is around November, you know, 2018. This was you know, for here, so I thought, well, let's look at them between November and March, and we've got two years of follow-up till uh, uh, you know 2021. So I said, let's let's see what happens to my patients uh, who are doing this. So again, uh, there are a lot smaller numbers: 25 in the control group, 15 in, in the intervention group, similar ages, uh, followed for similar times, and certainly their starting HbO and Cs were similar. Uh, at two years, the uh, control group had only gone up 0.3, which I think is pretty good, um, and their number of anti-diabetic medications, 1.9. Uh, the intervention group had gone down to 0.8, which we talked about uh, before, um, but at two years, it had gone down a smidgen more, 0.9. So it hadn't gone down a huge amount, but it had gone down a little bit more. Uh, and they're on you know, less medications. So again, I think uh, this is a, a clinically important difference, and it's you know, not only maintained, but improved over two years. Uh, I also looked at the patients with non-diabetic HbA1Cs, uh, five in each group. So again, the control group uh, has a, a slightly lower percentage, so they're, they're not, not quite as healthy at the beginning. Uh, two years later, they actually got an extra one, which uh, was great. Uh, so it went from 20 to 24 percent, but uh, the intervention group uh, went up uh, by three, so that went up from, uh, 30 th from 20 to uh, 50. Uh, sorry, from 33 to 57 percent. Small numbers, I, I know, but still, they're sort of going in the right direction. And uh, again, on less medications. So again, I think this is a clinically important difference. Uh, and achieved with less anti-diabetic medications. Now, I don't uh, see drug grips. I haven't seen them for about 20 years, but this ended up in my pigeonhole, and I've covered up the name of the medication because I don't want to pick on any particular medication, but they, this ended up on my pigeonhole just last week, and uh, I thought, well, this is interesting. They're promoting this medication, and it certainly works well. You know, a drop of 1.5% is, is uh, pretty good, but one of the things I notice in the graph is that, uh, you know, 30 weeks it seems to be at its lowest, and then the HbO and C seem to be rising for both medications, yeah? And I thought, well, that's interesting, which is exactly what my uh, endocrinology friend said happens. And uh, anyway, I just thought, how interesting is that? Um, you know, and this is okay for medications. There's no complaints about this. You know, this is just what we expect. Um, oh, and the other thing that was interesting is that 20% uh, discontinued treatment, one of the big criticisms of low carb is, oh, but people don't stick on it. But 20% of people discontinued treatment, 10% due to adverse effects, and 42% developed... Uh, Gastro side effects, uh, vomiting, nausea, etc., etc. So I thought, well, let's compare that to the low GI group that we've just looked at. Um, 
And uh, I think this, uh, the, actually low carb group, sorry. And I think this graph looks uh, somewhat better. And they're on less medications. They didn't actually, it wasn't clear how many medications the, uh, uh, the, the medication trial was on. They didn't sort of quite say it, but I guessed it was about 2.5 and I guess mine was on, uh, this is a slightly different group, but uh, 1.8 medications. And, and I should also mention the side effects that happen with uh, low carb. You get less reflux, so you get less distension, uh, less upset stomach. So some real significant side effects with the low carb group as well. Uh, okay, possible issues and biases of the audit. Not a randomised control trial. Clearly, it's not randomised control, uh, and this means that uh, you know there's, there's a bias probably in favour of the intervention, and uh, you know patients choosing intervention are probably likely to be more ma motivated. And of course, the doctor, that's me, is more motivated for patients choosing the intervention. But I still think it's, it's reasonable to say that for people who are motivated, both the doctor and the patients, dietary carbohydrate restriction can make clinically important differences in HbA1c, number of anti-diabetic medications, um, and the number of patients with a non-diabetic HbA1c. And these findings are consistent with findings from larger clinical trials. One last anecdote before I finish. I'm going to grab my phone and just... I got, a, I got an email just this morning from a patient and uh, I just thought, how lovely is this email? Hi Ron, I hope it's okay, where am I? I hope it's okay that I'm emailing you. I went clothes shopping today to, to a store that I would often struggle to fit into a size 26. Today I bought size 22 jeans. I couldn't believe it. She's quite a tall woman. She's about 185 centimetres. I couldn't believe it. I could even get into size 20. I'm so thrilled. Just wanted to share that with you and thank you for being there for me, for your patience, encouragement and coaching. I still have a ways to go, but it's an encouraging milestone. And I de she decreased the insu her insulin and said, also the eight units of insulin that she's on is really going well. My sugar numbers after dinner are now seven to eight. Thank you. <laughs>